Amen. Well, good morning. Thank you, worship team, and thank you guys for being here. You had a good day so far today? How many of you have not been awake enough to be able to answer that question appropriately? Need a little bit more time to figure out how that's going to go? Uh, I, I would like to do this. I, I, I promised myself that I, I will never speak, never teach, never lead w- without taking another moment to pray first because I, I realized from the very beginning, if it's about any ideas that I have, I'm in trouble. Uh, I want to make sure that we're going to take a moment and dedicate this time to the Lord. And if you would uh, indulge me one more time just for a moment, Lord, I thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for the privilege to share your word. And Lord, I pray that your word would go forth the way that you want it. Lord, the message that you have for your people this day, Lord, I know that, that there's someone in this room that can be changed by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that your word would not just be heard, but that it would be activated, that it would have impact in our life here today. And Lord, I just pray for something good because of who you are in this place. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing and acceptable in your sight this day. In your name we pray, amen and amen. Well, I just want you to know I'm thrilled to be here. Honestly, excited to preach. Uh, There is nothing in the world that I would rather do than to be able to share, teach, preach God's word. Uh, So I'm excited about it. But I got to admit, I am slightly nervous today. And when I say slightly, I mean just a little bit. I don't typically get in front of people. Uh, I don't know if that's my Italian blood or whatever it is, but I just like being in front of people. But a little nervous today because I just turned 50. Now, I've only been 50 for like a week, so I'm still figuring this out. I've got the 50-year-old training wheels on. Not really sure if I'm going to lose a step today or how it's going to be or not. But here's what I've learned just in the last week, is that when you turn 50, every single person that you know who is older than 50 will tell you that 50 is young. That, oh, it's, it's... You're just getting started. 50 is the new 40. It's not a big deal. They will go out of their way to make you feel great about turning 50. All of my friends who are younger than 50, I do not like anymore. Because they have gone out of their way to tell me that I am old. I am halfway to death. Like that they will go, how many of you understand that there are people that are like that? Some of you I like, some of you don't like. I've learned that I want to hang out with old people all the time. That's just what, I, what, what I've learned. Uh, but it also got me to thinking, because to be honest, I turned 50, but I feel no different. I don't. I don't know if you felt different when you turned 50. I felt exactly the same way as I did before. I think I look different, feel different, act different. I think it's the exact same, but my kids tell me that I am now super old. So I decided to find some evidence. And I look back just to find some pictures of when I first got here to Christ Chapel, which has now been a little over 19 years ago. I was 30 when I got here. I honestly feel exactly the same. Don't think I look hardly any different. So this is a picture of me from the first month that I got here at Christ Chapel a little over 19 years ago. I, I, don't, th- I don't think anything has changed. Like I feel... Exact. I mean, maybe, I, I think the hair cut a little bit. But other than that, just, just absolutely the same. The, the, the one thing that I can tell you that has changed in the time that I've been here now is that at this moment in life, right now, in, in, in the entire 50 years that I have lived, I have never had as good a prayer life as I do right now. Like, this is peak prayer life, praying more, praying fervent, good things are happening. I mean, I am serious about prayer. Now, I would like at this moment with a microphone preaching on a Sunday morning to tell you that there is a spiritual reason for that. But there is not. There has not been some breakthrough that got me to that place. My prayer life is what it is today because I now am the parent of a teenage driver. I did not know the heights, the depths, the stress. How many of you know what it's like to teach your teenager to to dress? God bless each and every one of you. I had no idea. I can honestly tell you I have sweat more in my car over the last couple of weeks than I ever have my entire life. I believe I have a picture of my son Jordan. He is my oldest. He just got his learner's permit. That is him on the right-hand side. I would like you to notice in that picture, there is one thing that's really important on the picture that is on your left, is that I am clearly still taller than him. 
Just want to make sure that that is out there, that that is known. So we got Jordan his learner's permit. That is a picture from his very first time behind the wheel. Can you see how serious he is? How many of you know he will never, ever drive like that again? So a learner's permit is basically a piece of paper that traps a parent with their kid while they're learning to drive. And for the most part, I want you to know that has been a good experience. I believe that Jordan, my oldest, is a good kid. He's responsible. He's talented. He's coordinated. He's going to be a great driver. But you know what he does not have? Experience. Doesn't that have confidence? He hasn't done it very much. And no matter how many video games you play, no matter how many cars you crash on a television screen, how many of you know that does not prepare you for driving in the real world? He thinks it does, but it does not. So we go out of our house and we go to my favorite place, the grocery store. No big deal. Mile and a half, make a right and another right, perfectly smooth. This kid's got it. Everything's good. We decide to step it up. We're going to come to the church, two and a half, three miles, Miniville, Prince William, Smoketown, boom, we're here. No problem. Everything's good. I'm going to be adventurous. Let's go out and get a Frosty at Wendy's, a Chick-fil-A sandwich. We've hit a drive through here and there. Love taking my kid to the drive through He can drive. I, unfortunately, still have to buy. And we go get some food. Everything is great. For some reason, with a real lack of wisdom, I decided to take Jordan on I-95. I'm just telling you, I don't believe in the Hail Mary full of, I, I, I don't even know how that works. I crossed myself. I prayed 87 times. I have never been so nervous and stressed in my entire life. I'm just telling you the truth. We, we go down Dell Boulevard. We go to make a right to get on I-95. And as we're going around the turn, I'm just praying, Lord, please don't let there be cars. Please don't let there be cars. Please don't let there be cars. I am praying for an opening, if you know what I'm talking about. How many of you realize there is never an opening on I-95? We start to go around this turn, and all of a sudden, I could feel the blood rush out of my body. It must have been Amazon delivery day. Because there was truck after truck after truck just zipping down the highway. And in that moment, I could see Jordan's face just get really nervous. Like he sits up in his chair, his eyes get really big. He's like, looking at the trucks, looking at dad, looking at the trucks, looking at dad. I'm like, dude, just keep your eyes on the road. I know you're not supposed to yell at your kids in that moment, but how many of you know I can ask for forgiveness, but, but I yelled multiple times. I'm like, Jordan, Come on, you can do this, you can do this, just watch. Please, God, please, God, help him, get in, God. He, he's going to go over, and to be honest, he starts getting a little bit nervous. And how many of you realize in that moment, as cars are just flying by going 55 miles over the speed limit, they are just zipping by, they are blurs. In that moment, Jordan does what most of us would do. He steps on the brake. He gets nervous. He's not sure if he's going to get in. He goes to slam on the brake. I'm like, no, punch it. Like, you've got to step on the gas. If you're not going as fast as they are, you are dead meat. You know what I'm talking about? you you got to pick up speed. I'm like, dude, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. He slams on the gas, and the car goes like this, right? We finally find a place to get in, and I promise you, I have never been so happy to be on I-95. I have not been on I-95 since that moment. He has relegated to local driving for the next year and a half. But that experience reminded me of something that I think happens in a lot of our lives. Because I think when things get tough, when things start going crazy, when the world starts to swirl around us and get difficult, that there is something in some of us that our instinct is to stop, our instinct is to freeze. And I want you to know that God wants us in those moments to keep moving forward, to have confidence in who God is and what he's called us to be. We need to know that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world, that I'm gonna press on towards the goal to win the prize for Christ Jesus, that we have not been called as a church to be silent, to be nervous, to be anxious, but to keep Moving forward, I believe that this moment in our church, in our nation, in our culture, 
demands a church and Christians that are not silent. Our culture needs the church. Our community needs Christians who will not be silent and nervous and stop, but will stand up and be confident and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. That while our world is debating the issues of the moment, they're talking about social issues and race and gender and education and all these things, the church cannot be absent from that debate. Christians cannot be nervous and be silent. But God wants us to keep moving forward, to stand up, to proclaim his word. Because God's word is not just true when it's easy. God's word is true each and every day. God's word is true no matter what the world will throw at us. And I can just tell you for me, my perception this past year is that there are too many Christians who have been nervous and silent and who have stopped. We have allowed ourselves to be overwhelmed by the moment. And you can't be overwhelmed when God is in you. What is in us is greater than he that is in the world. One of the greatest Bible accounts that there is, one of the most quoted stories that there is, is David and Goliath. People love the story of David and Goliath because this kid runs forward with confidence to tackle the greatest of giants of that day. We're all moved by that story, but we often forget that while David ran forward, the rest of the army stood there scared. And hundreds and thousands of God's people in the face of the giant just stood scared. And I don't know about you, but in this day, in this moment, I refuse to be the one that stands on the sideline. I refuse to sit back afraid of what might happen when we have an opportunity to move forward and see what God will do. I want to be someone that says, you know what, I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds the future. And I'm going to continue to put my faith and hope and trust in him. And I'm going to move forward with confidence. I'd like you to do this with me. If you have your Bible, you can turn there. If not, we're going to put the verse up on the screen. Today, I want to talk about a verse that I think is super important for this moment in time, and it's going to be our theme here for this morning, and it's found in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, and it says simply this, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, being confident in this, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. I'm going to read it one more time nice and loud, and I hope that you will say it and read it like you mean it. Because 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 6 says this. It says, being confident in this, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. When this verse is telling us that we need to have confidence, what does that mean? What, what does the word confidence mean? You, you, we can all hear each other today. What do you think of when you hear the word confidence? What does that mean? Someone nice and loud. What would you say? Bold. Boldness. I like that. What else do you think of when you think of the word confident? Sure, sure, that works. Anybody else, what do you think of? Confident, what comes to your mind? Secure, strong, I like that. I think we need to know exactly what this verse is telling us because when we think of the word confidence, I think some of us get the wrong idea. Because we have confidence in lots of things, lots of stuff. Some of you falsely have confidence in the Dallas Cowboys. I have no idea why. Some of us have confidence in ourselves. Some of us have confidence in a friend or a system. When we ask if we have confidence in something, what most of us really mean is that I think something is going to work out. I believe that something is likely. Something is probably going to happen. None of that is what this verse is calling us to do. When this verse is calling us to confidence, this word here means that it is an absolute certainty. We do not serve a God of maybe, probably, I think so, maybe I can. We serve a God of absolutely, I have, I will promise, and I will never let you down. We serve a God that we can count on and be absolutely sure that the things of God are not a fact. They are a fact and not a guess. Confidence is an inner certainty. When you actually look at the word that's being used here, the word means this, a settled issue. It's almost like going to court 
to prove a case. This has been debated and tried and weighed. It's been worked through and already proven to be correct. And that's the God that we serve. We need to have an inner belief, an inner confidence that is not just a guess. Christians are not called to go through life and just hope that things work out okay. I don't believe that God wants us to look at the future and think that things will probably be all right. I don't think God wants us to look at the future of our family or our church or our own life and say, you know what? I think we got a better than 50-50 shot going well. I think we need to be able to stand with confidence and say, you know what? I am 100% positive that God is in this place, that God is in my life, that God is in my family, and there is not a shadow of doubt in my mind that if God is in it, then God's going to take care of it. That I am positive in who he is and what he has for my life, and we need to have a real certainty in the God that we serve. We don't need to guess. We already know that God is in control. The, The problem with that is certainty is only gained through experience. If you look at the story of David and Goliath, you know why David could run forward with confidence? Because he had already worked out his faith. He had already put into practice in private what he needed so he could rise up in public. He had already beat the lion. He had already beat the bear. He had already put his faith in practice in the little things so that he could stand up and be confident against the giants in the land. I think that there are too many Christians who cannot stand against the giant because you don't stand in private, because you haven't worked out the little things. You haven't trusted God on a daily basis. How can you stand and say that God will answer your prayers when you don't really pray every day and let him show it to you? How can you stand on the promises of God when the giant comes, when you're not reading the word of God each and every day, when you're not quoting scripture as a part of your daily life? If we want to stand in the day of trouble, we've got to be willing to stand and take up our cross daily and follow him. Christianity is not just a moment. It is a lifetime. It is a daily experience. And we can grow in our confidence. We can grow in our certainty by allowing God to move in us each and every day. Man, I want to pray before I go into my house. Man, I want to dedicate this next meeting to the Lord. Man, I want to allow the word to move in me today and tomorrow. I want to trust God for my family and for my kids each and every day. And as we begin to see God move, man, he makes us more and more sure that his word is true. There's a reason that doubting Thomas doubted. Because he had touched Jesus in a meaningful way. But once he touched his side, once he saw his hands... Once he had that experience, his confidence grew to the point where he was willing to go all the way to death for the cause of Christ. Man, and I want to challenge you today to really examine your confidence in the cross. Man, are you willing to stand on the promises of God no matter what? Do you know that this isn't just a guess, but it's a fact? Because I've seen God move. God has touched my life. He has changed my home, my marriage. I've seen him answer my prayers, so I have no doubt that the next thing God has got just as much. Amen? I believe that we've been called to confidence. And confidence starts with an inner belief, an inner certainty in who God is. But confidence is more than just an inner certainty. It's an inner certainty that has outward evidence. How many of you know that if someone's confident, You can tell by looking at them. You ever seen anybody walk with confidence? Got a little strut, which I cannot do because my strut is more of a limp than a strut. But like, you know what I'm talking about, right? The person who is confident doesn't just walk around like this. Have you ever known anybody who is confident? How How does a confident person talk? A confident person talks like they are always gonna win. There is no doubt Maybe there's a little bit of ego. Their volume is different. Their mannerisms are different. Man, a person who is confident carries themselves in a different way. Confidence as a Christian is not just this inner idea in my head. I believe that God is real. I believe that God is real. If it is in you, 
it should show through you. We have not been called to an idea of confidence, but to a life of confidence. Matthew chapter 5, 16 says, Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good work and glorify your Father which is in heaven. John 15, 8 said, It is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, proving that you are my disciples. Guys, I want you to know that today we have been called not just to the idea of confidence, but to walk in a visible, outward confidence that we know who God is. Man, everywhere you go, you should walk victorious. Everywhere you go, you should talk victorious. Man, I know that I've heard the bad news on TV, but I'm tired of Christians talking more about the bad news than they do the good news of the gospel. I can walk in a world that's a mess and have confidence that God is still in control. The world should look at Christians and say, you know what? In the environment that they're in, there's something different about him. How can he be steady? How can he be calm? How can he still have a smile on his face? How can he approach life this way? You know why? Because I'm confident in who God is. And the one that is in me is going to keep carrying me through. And I believe that our neighborhoods and communities need Christians who believe in their heart and show in their deeds and proclaim with their mouth that God is good and that God's got this. Amen? Confidence is an inner certainty that has got to have outward evidence. Guys, I want you to know this, and I mean this sincerely. We have never been called to be fake. We do not need to go around and pretend as Christians. Are the problems in the world real? Yes. Is stress real? Yes. In this world, you will have tribulations. Do we need to pretend like it's not there? No. Do we need to be deniers of those things? No. But you know what? As real as those things are, my God is real too. And I am not going to be overwhelmed by the problems. I will acknowledge them. I will deal with them. I will discuss them. But always in the light of who God is. I'm going to stand on his word and proclaim his word no matter how hard the storms around me may blow. Amen? Confidence is an inner certainty with outward evidence. Our verse this morning, Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 says this, says being confident in this, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. The next part after confidence is this, it says confident in this that he, I want to stop there. Just one word is a super important point. I need you to realize, underline, highlight, exclamation part, exclamation point, that confidence is always in he and never in me. Confidence is always in he and never in me. Guys, I hope you know and understand what I'm about to say is that I can do absolutely nothing. There is no talent that I have that wasn't gifted to me by God. There is no item that I have, nothing that I've achieved that isn't because of God's grace and his goodness and his protection and provision in my life. There is nothing that I will ever accomplish that is outside of the goodness and the plan of God in my life. We've got to understand that we can move confidently forward in this world, but that it is all rooted purely and wholly in who God is. Man, he deserves all the credit. He deserves all the, all the praise. The word tells me in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 that I will trust in the Lord with all my heart and lean not on my own understanding. I don't care how smart you are. I don't care how many degrees you've earned. I don't care what title you have. If you lean on yourself, you are in trouble. We need to lean on and trust in God. It is always about he and never about me. I need you to hear this super precise for a minute. If your faith, if your hope, if your trust was in Bill Roberts, you're in trouble. If your security, if your spirituality, if your stability is in Bill Baker, Jeff Nordine, 
Fran, Tim, Bob, Carrie, whoever it is, Christ Chapel, the elder board, the team, whatever it is, you missed it. God has used this church. God has set this church here for a reason. I believe that God's hand has been on this place. I believe that God's hand is on this place. I believe that God is going to do great things in this place. But there should never be anything, there should never be anyone that moves into the seat that's supposed to be occupied by God. Do not ever elevate a person, a staff member, a church, a group, a denomination above the fact that we rely wholly and solely on the goodness of God. People will come and go. Denominations will come and go. Churches, even this one, will come and go. But the goodness of, the, of God will remain forever. And my hope and my trust is always in he and never in me. I hope you love this church. I hope you feel comfortable in the classes. I hope you identify with people on staff and that you love being here. But man, my confidence is in the fact that God loves me. That God cared enough to give his life for us. The rest is a team of support people that work together to love each other. But it's always about he and never about me. Philippians 1.6 says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you, he who began a good work in you. Now I want to evaluate that just for a minute because the verse here says, A, good work. It's not just some random good thing. This is not the Bible saying, hey, Ebenezer, I want you to know, God's got something good for you. Hey, Miss Charlotte, something good's coming your way. That's not what this verse means. When it's telling us that he who began a good work in you, what he's talking about is the work, the work of salvation. This is a reminder that, you know what, when you doubt, when you fear, when you're not sure what's going to happen next, remember God loved you enough to save your soul. God transformed your life. God gave everything so that you could be forgiven. Do you really believe that God would come down from heaven and give his life and sacrifice everything just to leave you now? We need to remember in those days of doubt, in those days of fear, in those days of struggle, that the same God that saved my soul is going to be there with me today and in the days to come. Amen? It says that he who began a good work in you. When it says began, the word there means that it has been set in motion. That, that God has begun a process in us. That he has started something. How many of you realize that the day you were saved was not the end of anything? It was the beginning of a new life in God. That this verse is telling us that, that our confidence is not just about a moment. It's about understanding that the God who loved you, the God who saved you, the God who forgave you wants to be with you each and every day. That it is a process of me putting away my old self and becoming more and more like him. And God wants to be with us in that process. Christianity is not just an event. It's not just a moment. It's a daily lifestyle. We need to be confident in this, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful. Can you say faithful? Man, I love the word faithful. Here's what I know is that nowadays, there are not a lot of things that are made to last. Have you noticed that kids' toys break in like a minute and a half? How many of you think that there is a conspiracy to do that on purpose? I mean, I might be the only one, maybe I'm the conspiracy theorist, but I think they specifically make things so that it looks good. Give me 1995. Get in the parking lot. It'll break. Your kid will cry, and you got to buy another one. That's just what I think. Most things we have are not meant to last. We're convinced that our cell phone is the greatest, newest, coolest thing in the world. And a week later, it is old and horrible, and it needs to be replaced. They're working on batteries that can drive cars halfway around the country. And yet they can't figure out keeping the battery in this charge more than, like, what, what are they doing? 
I think that the things we have are specifically not made to last. Unfortunately, stuff doesn't last. Institutions don't last. Sometimes in our life, relationships don't last. What I want you to know is that God is the exception to those things. That God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God doesn't go on vacation. Your prayers don't go to voicemail. God doesn't get tired. But the same God that parted the Red Sea, the same God that empowered Samson, the same God that delivered his people again and again, the same God that rose Jesus from the grave, the same God that saved your soul is going to be faithful each and every day. What that means to me is that God is always by your side, even when you don't see it. My wife said something to me yesterday, super, super smart, because she is way smarter than me, way better looking than me, and because I said that, I'm hoping she will be nice to me. I need all the help that I can get, but yesterday we're out for a walk, and it was a little cloudy outside, and for some reason on a cloudy day, people seem to be a little more down, a little more gloomy, just a little more, ah, because it's not nice outside. Do you realize that even on the cloudiest of days that the sun is still shining? Just because you don't see it doesn't mean God's not there. God's presence is with you each and every day, no matter where you go. And I pray that you will be confident today in this, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful. Amen? I'm going to close by doing something I honestly never, ever thought I would do in this church. I've tried really hard to keep something secret, and I'm not going to keep it secret anymore. I really love art. Any artists? Anybody likes it? Nobody. I'm the only one. I should have kept it a secret. That was horrible. How many? I'm just going to leave right now. Raise your hand. How many of you really like to draw? How many of you like to paint? Just like to sculpt or do art things or even just go to an art gallery or do kind of things like that. People may not think that's me, may not seem it, it, that it's consistent with who you think I am or not. I love art. I grew up as a kid drawing all the time. I think it came from the fact that my parents didn't want me to get in trouble in school. So when I was done with my work, rather than talk and get in trouble, my parents just told me to draw. And I started drawing pictures of my teachers I started drawing little cartoons of my teachers doing weird things. I started drawing my classmates, and as I got better at it, I would kind of leave them on the desk, and the teachers would laugh, and then they'd ask me, hey, can you do another little cartoon or something or whatever it was? And it's not something that I'm that good at. It's not something I've done for years. But I really thought it maybe it would be okay to draw something for you guys today. Is that okay if I show you something? So I'm going to try this. Now, I want you to know I'm honestly nervous, like I'm being serious. I do not like this at all, because if you're a person that draws, if you're a person that does art, how many of you know the best art sometimes is the things that people never see? Like, I just don't like people seeing it. And, and to me, my least favorite part of drawing or art or whatever is when people look while I'm doing it. Like, if you're drawing and someone comes in the room, you got to do like this. Right? She knows what I'm talking about. Because what happens if somebody sees while you're drawing, what are they going to do? What is that? That looks stupid. What is that? Is that like a hat or a duck or a thing? Like they start saying crazy things, and it makes me want to quit. So I'm taking a chance here, and here's what I've done. I'm going to show you just the first night. I drew some things on the first night. I want you to take a look at what I did, and here's the deal. Lord, help me. Keep me strong. Forgive me. Whatever it is. Here's Bill Baker artwork. We are not having art classes anytime soon. Here it is. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm being really serious. When I flipped the page, I heard somebody say, what the heck? That's exactly why I don't show people. Like the whole reason to not show you is because I don't want people to criticize. Everybody's like, what? 
is that? I don't know if you can see it. If you can't, it's kind of on the screen. I know that's not good either. But, but here's what I want you here's, It's okay, buddy. Here's, here's what I want you to see. For me, because I, I, I like to draw, it's a, it's a really time-consuming thing. Like, I really want to be patient. you got to get it right. How many of you know if you draw a picture of your wife and her ear is the wrong direction, it's not going to go well? So, so this is my attempt to provide a foundation. Like, I honestly sat here for a whole day almost with a ruler and measuring things and making sure there's proportion and how it would fit on the page to make everything just right. But if you look at it, it's just a bunch of lines. Like, it looks ridiculous. You would look at this and be honestly disappointed if this was the whole thing. But it's not. I still don't think this is that good, but this is my finished product that I finished last night. <clears throat> it's funny because I'm I still it, I, it bothers me. Like it, it's weird when you draw something yourself, but to me, it's inspiring to just take time to be detailed, to keep working at it. Because what starts off like such a mess that's just a couple scribbles over time can begin to take shape. The reason I tell you that is this, is because I believe that there are people who stop right now and they look at the picture of their life and they don't like what they see. They look at where they are and they're disappointed by the moment. They look at the things that they're going through and say, this doesn't make sense. Why is this the way that it is? This isn't the way that I wanted things to be. That They're frustrated by the way things are. We deal with disappointment. We deal with things that are frustrating. We're confused. We ask God, God, what are you doing in my life? God, I never thought I'd be here. God, why is this what I'm going through? God, I thought you had something better for me. I really thought that the picture of my life would look like something completely different. And I believe that God is in heaven, if that's you, saying, just be patient. I am not done yet. The Bible verse tells me, be confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Don't judge this moment. Don't get caught up in the things you don't understand. Believe in your heart that God's got this, that God's going to finish the work, that the things that God has promised you are going to come to pass. The path that God has put you on is going to lead to his blessings and his promises. If you look in the Bible, it's so many Bible characters. You could look at the story of Joseph. When Joseph gets thrown into the hole, and you'd say it was a disappointment, but God was not done yet. You could look at the story of Peter when Peter denied Christ, and you'd say, you know what, Peter is a failure, but God was not done yet. If you look at story after story, even David, as many good things as David did, you could look at a picture of his life as he's running and hiding in caves and think his life turned into a big waste. But God was not done yet. I don't know where you are right now today. I don't know, I don't know what struggles are going on, how, how difficult things are in your own body, in your marriage, in your home. I don't know how nervous you are about the future or what's going to take place next. But I want you to believe in your heart that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. God, it might not make sense to me. God, it might even be ugly in my eyes. God, none of it look like it lines up. But I'm confident that in the end, God's got this. Amen? Amen. Being confident of this, that he who began good work in you will be faithful to complete it. I'm going to ask you just to bow your head and close your eyes for a minute. And I just want to ask in this place, if maybe there's somebody in this room 
who would say, Pastor, my confidence is shaken. There's so many things going on in my life. This has been a really hard year. There's things that I'm struggling with, things that I don't understand. Pastor, today, I need to proclaim God's confidence again in my life. God, I need to stand firm in his promises. I know that there is tribulation in this world, but man, I want God to give me strength. I want God to bless me in this place. I believe that God can carry me through. If that's you here this morning, I'm not going to tell anybody. Nobody's going to look around. I'm just going to ask you to boldly lift up your hand and say, today in the world that we live, God, I need to renew my confidence in you and who you are. Just raise your hand around this place, hands all over this room. Maybe you're here in this place today and you'd say, you know what? If I'm being honest, there's things I'm really disappointed with in this moment in my life. This is not how I thought things would work out. I'm really not happy about the picture that I see. Today, I want you to know that if you will give God an opportunity, that God will finish the work in you, that you are God's masterpiece, that you are his handiwork. The Bible tells us that I know the plans I have for you, declared the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. I believe with all my heart that today that God has a plan for you, that God's got good things in store for you. Today, all we've got to do is step out in faith and say, you know what? I'm going to be confident that the God who began a good work in me is going to be faithful to complete it. God, do a work in me. If that's you in this place here today, I'm just going to ask you one more time. This isn't for me. This is for God. This is you taking a moment to raise your hand and say, God, do a work. God, finish what you started. God, allow your plans to be completed in me. If that's you this day, between you and God, nice and high, raise your hand and say, God, finish the work. God, keep working in me. God, finish the picture. God, take care of my home and my life and my family. God, continue to carry me through. Here's what I'm going to do, guys, just for a minute. I believe that confidence is not just an inner belief. It's got outward evidence. And if you really want God's blessing in your life today, if you really want to start new in him today, if you really want God to finish a work in you today, I believe there's something about having the confidence to stand up and make it known. If you're here today, what I'd like to do is just to take the next five minutes, six, seven minutes, that if you're in this place and you need a touch from God, that you want God to pour his abundance out on you, that you want his Holy Spirit to lead you, I haven't even asked, and there's people standing all over the room already. Man, I'm going to ask you just to stand to your feet, and if you want to come down to this altar, I would love to agree with you and pray that God will do something special in you today that this won't be a day that you just came to church, that this will be a day that you had an encounter with God. If that's you, I'm going to ask you just to come forward. You can stay in your seat and praise and pray and worship. We're going to wrap up in just a couple minutes. And, but I believe that God wants to renew a right spirit in us today, that God wants to encourage his church, that God wants to strengthen our resolve. And I'm going to encourage you just for a moment and to pray like you mean it, to pray like you want it, God, do a work in me this day. I